All right then. Uh, functionalism. Functionalism is a consequence of the mind-brain identity theory. In fact, um, it's the, um, the, the pretty much the argument for functionalism is pretty much just the mind-brain identity theory. It is a sort of logical follow-on. Um, so. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to um, talk about functionalism, the argument for functionalism, um, what it means, and I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, objections to functionalism. I'm going to talk about uh, at least two objections to functionalism. There's a couple more objections in the book that I'd like to talk about if I have time, and then talking about them I think will help you understand functionalism a, a bit more uh, deeply. Um, uh, so I'll get to those if I have time. And if I don't get to them, they won't be on the test. Right. So, uh, so the first thing is I'm going to talk about what functionalism, functionalism says. And the idea is Anything that does what human brains do will make make a mind. Now, what this means, in the most, in the most concrete terms, is um, it, it, it asserts the theoretical possibility of actually constructing a machine that will make a mind. Now, uh, there's some caveats are in order. This machine would have to be really, really big and really, really, really complicated. Because the human brain is about the most complicated thing in the universe. It's the most thing, most complicated individual thing we know about. Um, the number of possible circuits going from neuron to neuron to neuron to neuron and then back to the, to the same neuron uh, in the human brain is larger than the number of particles in the universe. You sit down and calculate the number of possible so um, your, your brain contains something like 300 billion neurons. A, a neuron is a very, 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 very small object. A very complicated object, but it's also very, very small. And you've got a lot of them in your brain. So when I say that uh, one day we'll be, a, we, one day human beings will be capable of making a computer that makes a mind or some other kind of machine that makes a mind, an artificial mind, an artificial consciousness. I'm not saying it'll happen next week. I'm not saying it will happen, um, I'm not saying it'll happen uh, any time, I'm not saying it'll happen in my lifetime or your lifetime or your grandchildren's lifetime. So, um, all right. So the way I want to tr uh, want to introduce this is I want to tell a sort of story. Um, first thing is I want you to visualize or think about how your brain is made. Uh, and we're just going to talk about the cognition part of it. Emotions are handled through hormones, which makes it a little more complicated. But the cognition part of your brain, actually thinking, hoping, dreaming, summarizing stories, creating stuff, that's done with neurons. And here's a sort of a, a model of a neuron, a sort of picture of a neuron. There's a cell body 
has in it a, a nucleus. Uh, I don't know that if that's important. Um, there's bits that come into one side of the cell called dendrites. Actual neurons are way more complicated than this. This is a sort of rudimentary neuron. The uh, uh, usual neuron has thousands of dendrites, and it also has uh, it has an axon, which is a long nerve, sort of a nerve cable that ends in what's called arborization, which is where it where it splits out. And neurons in your brain are organized in a, a particular way. And if we say that the ends of the arborization um, tendrils are uh, arrows, we represent them like that. They don't actually look like arrows, but that's to show what it is. And the ends of the dendrites are little targets like this. Every every um, dendrite has coming to it um, tendrils from the arborizations of other neurons. Any of you familiar, familiar with this? Right, so there's inputs from all kinds of other neurons, and then there's outputs to the dendrites of other neurons. Going along. And this is repeated thousands upon thousands of times for every neuron. Oops, it's supposed to be green. There's input neuron, there's the input tendrils and the output tendrils, and signals always flow along the axon, this way they flow from the body to the arborization, then into the dendrites of other cells. So the information flows one way in your brain. And did you know your brain is binary? Sort of a digital system like a computer? Because this thing is not an analog device. It doesn't have a signal that's going, that goes up and down like radio waves. This is either on or off. It either fires, it sends a signal, or it doesn't. And so some neurons in your brain are sending lots and lots and lots of signals, and others are sending signals at a much lower rate, and some are hardly signaling at all. And inside the, the neuron, there's a sort of chemical uh, machinery that uh, processes information. It takes the, takes the input signals, again, on or off, you know, little pulses coming along the dendrites. And some of them are inhibitory. They say, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. And the other ones are saying, shoot, shoot, shoot. So imagine you've got like a water pistol or a gun, and there's people yelling in your ear. And you've got multiple ears, but you, you know, some guy's saying, shoot, shoot, shoot. Some other guy's saying, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. And you sort of calculate and balance these off. And when you get more shoots than don't shoots, you shoot. Or, or you get a lot of shoots, a higher proportion of shoots. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of details here. But again, there are these neurons, right, in your brain, making your consciousness, making your mind. That's the machinery of the brain. Okay, now, now that's, that's reality. I want you to follow me now into a sort of realm of fantasy to something that could be imagined. I want you to imagine that you have a degenerative brain disease. Your, your brain is degenerating. Um, some, your neurons are dying. And you come to me, I'm a, I'm a doctor, and I've developed a nanotechnology to fix this. And this is how it works. I inject you with, with uh, large quantities of little nanobots, happy little robots. With little extensor arms and claws and things. And for some reason, feet. I don't know. So we've got these little nanobots. 
or they could be a tailored virus or something like that. You got these little nanobots in here. And we've also got um, bits of machinery, that, like, like little sort of spare parts, like little cable sections and tubes and little, I don't know, computer processor, chips, transistors, some kind of mechanical machinery, maybe silicon based, uh, using quantum mechanical effects to store or process information. Some like really tiny machines, right? It probably isn't possible, but uh, you know, <coughs> go with me here. And so, what your little nanobots here can do is that they can detect they can detect dying neurons. So you have neurons in your brain that are dying. And these little guys go along and they find them. And what they do is they take that neuron and they take all this, these spare parts, this, the, the, these raw materials that are in the bloodstream with them. They take those and they build a duplicate neuron in exactly the same place right next door to it. And that is functionally the same. Right? This is a mechanical neuron, but it does exactly what the old neuron, the, the flesh neuron, would do. It has an arborization, and, um, which splits into tendrils that go to the same dendrites that the other one did, and it has its own dendrites that go out and parallel the function, oops, parallel the function of the uh, original dendrites. So when the blood neuron, right, the flesh neuron dies, the mechanical neuron takes over exactly as the old neuron would have functioned including changing, right? Changing the program inside here. Because your neurons actually change all the time. Um, every time you form a memory, synaptic uh, firing loadings change, the processing changes inside neurons. And um, these synapses, you get more and less as you go on. Some of them die and they make more. The, your brain cells are always changing. Um, your brain is actually producing new brain cells. My, um, my um, old friend Robert has a t-shirt that says, yes, alcohol kills brain cells, but only the weak ones. But it's not actually true that alcohol kills brain cells. The effect of alcohol is it reduces the rate at which new brain cells are produced. Which is still, you know, not good, but it's, it's not quite as, not as bad. So, or so I tell myself. Um, so we have this thing, and you know, you put it in there, and it replaces the dying neurons. So you've got this degenerative brain disease, and every week you come to me and I, I shoot you up with these um, nanobots and raw materials that go to work inside your brain finding dying cells, replacing them, and as the cells die, the mechanical neurons take over. Exactly the same function. They do everything that the old brain cell will have done, including adapting and changing and growing and shrinking and whatever it, the old neuron would have done in response to information coming to. And, uh, and these react to hormones in exactly the same way. And if you like, we can also make artificial glands. Right, the, the, um, the nanobots replace all the glands in your brain as they degenerate. So every part of your brain is replaced by mechanical analogs that do the same thing. And so, right, um, you come in after a week and I say, well, 1% of your neurons has died, but it's okay because they've all been replaced. A few weeks later, you come in and, and, say, and say, well, the disease, unfortunately, is progressing. We don't have any cure for whatever's making your neurons die. But we're replacing those neurons as we go along. And right now, 5% of your neurons 
have been replaced. Would you notice any difference in your thinking? The new neurons do exactly the same thing as the old neurons. So they replace them and they're doing the function. And so you've got flesh neurons mixed in with mechanical neurons and they're all doing, everyone's, each one's doing a different thing but all the mechanical ones are doing what flesh ones would have done. So the neurons that are used to getting signals from this guy still get signals in the same way just that now the red ones die and the black ones there um, producing the signals. It's the same thing, release of neurotransmitters in the synaptic gap. Right. So, right, electrical signals along the axon, um, internal processing here now done by a machine rather than... Okay, so you keep coming back to me, I keep giving you these, these injections, your, your brain is fine, uh, except it's getting more and more mechanical. And at a certain point, say a few years down the line, you come in and I say, well, you know what, I can't, I'm, I'm um, going to change the injection. Um, we're doing just maintenance bots now, just to make sure that these neurons don't get damaged, right? They just keep the neurons going. Because <coughs> you, well, you have no longer have any flesh neurons. Your brain has been replaced by a complete mechanical analog that is made of neurons, mechanical neurons, exactly the same way, it's exactly the same way your brain would have been at that time without the disease, except that whatever the flesh neurons did is now done by mechanical neurons. Do we have any reason to think there would be a difference? Now, suppose there's a change in the way uh, neurotransmitters, uh, the, the change in the way signals get across synapses. Instead of neurotransmitters, we use radio waves. It does the same thing. It, 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 it gets, the, uh, gets the signal across the gap in exactly the same way. Um, and the only effect you have is you're now immune to nerve gas because nerve gas um, creates um, neurotransmitters inside your, inside your body and floods your nerves so you, you're paralyzed. That would be kind of cool actually, immune to nerve gas. There was a doctor doing episode about that, wasn't there? There was a what? There was a doctor doing episode with Really? I need to get caught up with Dr. Hope. Yeah, I think oh, she's the first season. Yeah. Uh, well, nanites, yes, but nanites are not just well, our well, Right, but did they use the thing of being immune to nerve gas because your synapses are radio waves rather than neurotransmitters? I don't think so, because I just thought of that. So you saw it here first, that's my idea. I'm going to put all this stuff into stories. I want to write a book of stories, philosophical stuff, in which this stuff happens. Uh, and we explore the philosophical implications, which would make them boring stories, but uh, I don't care. I'm just trying to entertain myself. So you have this entire, you have, your brain has been replaced by a machine that does exactly what your brain would have done if, uh, if, it, if the cells weren't dying. Functionalism says, that's fine. It does the same thing. You have a thinking process. You would have the thinking process. The only thing that uh, you have to work, the only thing now is that you have to try and make sure your body doesn't wear out because this brain is going to like keep going. You're not going to go senile, right? If the brain is maintained physically, you know, in the story, in actual fact, we can't. We probably will never be able to do this. It's just, I don't think it's technically feasible. To make, to make an artificial neuron the same size as a human neuron. But if we were able to do that, it would do what your brain does. Right? This is one of the things that functionalism says, and I don't see any reason to think that this is false. Now, suppose, you know, your body is... Uh, 
suppose that your body is wearing out and you go to some quack, not me, I'm cool. You go to some guy who says, I can make you immortal. And he says, what he's going to do is take your um, artificial neurons and have them scanned by some kind of device, maybe more nanobots. Maybe it's a round nanobot with a scared expression for some reason. Maybe you have a scary mind. And they're going to go in and they're going to copy these, um, these neurons into a computer. So it's now in a computer, and this is now a virtual neuron. So you've got a what you've got to hear is a virtual neuron in a computer. So this is a diagram of how information is being processed in a computer. Right, so we have these, you know like object-oriented programming, you can have programs that have modules, and modules talk to other modules. And so now we have modules in the computer that act like neurons. They send out signals to other modules, the way a neuron sends out signals to other neurons. Information flow is one way. Everything is emulated, not imitated, emulated. They're doing the same thing. And information is passing on. Because the thing here is that the, the thing is that the, the artificial neuron could be transmitting anything, any information any way it likes. All that counts is that a signal goes from this cell to the other cells that it's talking to. That's all, that that's all that happens in your brain is that cells send signals to other cells and the signal can take any form. Here, it's electrochemical along here. There's a complicated electrical and chemical process that goes along here purely because that's the most efficient. It could be all electric, it could be all chemical. And then here there's a chemical right, transmission that goes to closes the gap. But that could be electrical too, or it could be radio waves, or it could be smoke signals. Well, probably not smoke signals. But anything that gets a signal from here to here is transmitting a signal from here to here. And that's what is making your mind. And so we have these... So this is really a computing device. Your neurons are computing devices, and we can create computing devices virtually. We can convey them inside a computer by providing data structures. Now, a, the average computer would be lucky if it could create a single neuron. My computer, I don't know if it could do a single, single neuron of the complexity of a human neuron. Um, according to Steven Pinker, the best supercomputer we have right now could maybe make a nervous system of the complexity of a snail. So we could have a snail, virtual snail brain if we wanted to make it. And it would be difficult and expensive to do because it's like really complicated. But let's say that you know, in the future, we might have much, much more powerful computers. And let's say that we do. Say we have computers that are several orders of magnitude more powerful than the ones we have now, so that they could contain billions of artificial neurons all hooked together in just exactly the same way the human brain is. Um, so, What happens when this mad scientist you visited turns on the computer, right? It's copied all of your brain patterns. Your brain became mechanical, all the patterns have been copied, all the circuits, everything's been copied into a computer. It turns on. What happens to you? Well, you're standing there looking at the computer and you're asking, you know, when do I become immortal? 
Just because you're copied into a computer doesn't mean that you're in the computer. When you turn on the computer, a very surprised voice will come up and say, say, hey, how did I get into a computer? Oh, I'm immortal. And you say, no, you're not. You're not me, because there's a copy of you in a computer. Do you see how that works? Um, so, but this is turned on. You start talking to it, it's a, it's a mind, it thinks like you, and it's made in a computer. And that is what functionalism says we can do, eventually. Inshallah, the crit don't rise if computers get good enough. All right, any, any questions so far? Is this, is this making sense? Any, any ideas about it? All right, so I'm going to try and talk about the arguments for functionalism, the arguments supporting the idea that this, that this is possible. Part of the argument for functionalism is just mind-brain identity theory. Everything we discussed last week about mind-brain identity theory is part of the support for functionalism. Minds make, sorry, brains make minds by doing stuff. Anything else that does the same stuff will make a mind. Um, another support for um, well, let's see how I can how I work this in. Um, So I want to talk about the difference between a system and a thing. A system is a connection is a, is a a collection of parts that are linked together to perform a function. Um, in the um, Science Museum in Chicago, in one of the stairwells, there's these little demonstrators for, for little machines for converting one kind of motion to another. Um, one of them is this thing, you turn the little hand crank, and this th rod goes back and forth, turns a circular motion into a back and forth motion. Um, I don't know, there's an up, down, there's a, 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 a mo where it's something where you pull something in and out or move it back and forth, and it makes something turn. All those mechanical little things. They're systems. Uh, if you look at a fuel injector in a car, it's a mechanical system for uh, aerosolizing gasoline and getting it into uh, the, the cylinders of, a, of the car, right? So my computer is a system because there's interconnected parts. They, they, what they do is put electricity back and forth, electrons back and forth in various states uh, and levels. And it makes, it has this output. 
And I want to distinguish from that because homogeneous things, bit, things that don't have parts, can't do stuff. So you take a river rock and try to use it like, a, like it's a cell phone. You know those, big, those round river locks, rocks? Right. The only thing you can do with that you know, is throw it at people or use it as a paperweight or, or, or stuff like that. It, it can't do anything. It can't translate force from one form to another. It's not a system. It, it, right? it can't do any functions. Does that make sense? Right. And so the competing theory to mind-brain identity theory, right, dualism, which has failed miserably at every test so far, also fails here. Dualism says that the mind is an indivisible, immaterial thing. But if the mind is an immaterial, indivisible thing, how does it do different things at different times? How does it translate inputs into outputs? Right. A speaker right, from your stereo is a system. Electricity comes in, a signal comes in from, uh, from, from a wire, and that signal, which is just pulses of electricity down a wire, little tiny pulses of extra, modulated pulses of extra, is turned into sound. Right? Because it's a system, it has parts, it's not a homogeneous object. There's part, even a solid state, you know what solid state technology is, right? It's those chips on a, on a PCB, right? You have these little large monoblock chips with little wires coming out, right, and they're on the, they're on the PCB. Uh, these are not homogeneous inside. They're very highly structured. There's uh, layers of insulation and layers of conductor, and they're all mixed up together in a very precise way so that electricity flows along the little, the little conductors and goes into transistors and, and changes signals and does a lot of complicated stuff I really don't understand. But they're not just you know, homogeneous lumps, right? So mind is something. Mind is a, is a function. It's something that is done. Right? So it's done by a system. And the only system we know about that, is, um, that we have is the brain. So. Um, and the other concept uh, involved with my um, functionalism is the idea of multiple realizability. heard of the Wright Flyer, uh, the first heavier than air aircraft to, to fly. What was it? Do you know, guys know what it was made of? Uh, it was made of wood and uh, I think maybe silk doped fabric, uh, wood fabric and wire. There's a tiny little petrol engine to give it motive power. Uh, but it was wood and fabric, wooden cloth. Um, does that mean that an airplane has to be made of wood and cloth in order to fly? Could one be made of plywood? Sure, if it's in the same shape. The Lockheed Company uh, made it big by making plywood aircraft. It's pretty cool. They were, they were made by a pneumatic, uh, the hulls were made by a, a pneumatic process. Um, what about metal, though? You know, wood and you know, wood. All the airplanes are made of wood. You can't make an airplane out of metal, right? It's the wrong stuff. No, you can make an airplane out of metal. You can make an airplane out of anything. There's a company called Scaled Composites that makes airplanes out of very exotic materials involving carbon fibers and I, I don't know what. I don't know what they make them out of. It's just basically kinds of plastic. And they make some really cool looking planes too. They're really weird, look like big insects, and stuff like that. Um, so, multiple realizability says that if you have something that does a particular function, anything else that works the same way will accomplish the same function.
function. Uh, some materials are better than others. So usually when there's multiple realization, everybody uses the best material. Cannons used to be made from cast iron. Then they found out a way to make them from brass, cast brass. And then they figured out how to cast steel. And they started making steel cannons. Um, and from that, they were able to make breech loaders. Because the steel would allow you to make a, uh, you make a breech that would actually lock and not explode when you fired the, sh uh, the cartridge. So you can do things with different materials. As long as you're doing the same thing, you get the same result. Same process, same result. Okay. Any questions so far? All right, so this is functionism. And as far as I can tell, this is a perfectly sensible theory. I don't see anything wrong with it anywhere. So I'm now going to talk about um, philosophical objections to fun functionalism. So I'm going to erase this. So, the most famous argument against functionalism, or the fam most famous argument against computer consciousness is called the Chinese Room Argument by uh, John Searle. So, John Searle, if he's still alive, still believes that this has proved that functionalism is false and that computers cannot have minds. Ever. And I'm going to see if I can represent this. I'm going to see if I can represent this argument uh, correctly. By the way, of course, as in anything else I do in this classroom, if I'm representing someone else's argument, and I think that that argument is bad, you should always worry about, well, maybe Dr. Young is not representing this argument correctly. He doesn't agree with this argument. Maybe he's made a mistake about what it says. I mean, I've done that um, before, presumably, that I, I, I thought an argument was bad because I didn't understand it. So maybe that's what's going on here. That's always something that should be in the back of the mind, that maybe I'm misrepresenting Searle's argument. Right. You don't have to think about that for the final, but you can you know, think about it for your paper assignments or, or whatever. Just a sort of the back of thing, like any other instructor, I could be wrong about anything I'm talking about. So I'm going to try and represent the argument. Try and make it clear. As, as we, I don't think it's a horrible argument. I think it's a very interesting argument. And I think that it actually uh, allows us to start a discussion about certain important things, particularly about the nature of semantics. Remember we talked about semantics before? We talked about the nature of meaning, what is, what is meaning. We're going to have this conversation uh, again here. So the argument is Computers can only do computations which are manipulations of abstract
abstract symbols. Um, <coughs> Abstract symbol manipulation is just syntax, word order, let's say. It can't do semantics. Semantics is the study or process of ascribing and deriving meaning to symbols. Right? Knowing what stuff means. Computers can't do semantics. Um, mind, mental operations, including consciousness, remember that consciousness is only a part of your mind. Consciousness is just one thing your mind does. Right. You know the term conscious thought? There's people talk about conscious thought. Conscious thought is a thought you are conscious of. So when you're thinking and you're conscious of what you're thinking, that's conscious thought. If you're thinking but you're not conscious of what you're thinking, that's not conscious thought. Have you ever had this, this experience of realizing what you think a long time after you thought it. Does that make sense? You don't know what you believe and someone asks you a question and then right off the top of your head you give an answer and like, oh well, that's what I thought. I didn't really know that. No? Okay. Just me then. So mind and consciousness require semantics. Mind and consciousness require semantics, don't mean a common. That's it, I mean that seems pretty, pretty certain. Mind and consciousness require semantics. I think that um, you know anything that doesn't know the meanings of words is not conscious. So So computers can't ever have minds. That's Searle's conclusion. All right. So I want to try and let that. Uh, um, now, before I go on to the Chinese room, I want to talk about something called the Turing test, which which kind of leads up to that. Um, So you have two rooms, um, and in one you have a guy sitting at a keyboard, a chair, a monitor, All right, he's typing away, and he's seeing um, 
seeing responses on the on the screen. So keyboard and screen. You've got a computer, laptop, desktop, what some kind of computer. In the original example, it was a teletype because they did not have these uh, these things. By the way, Turing. Alan Turing was the father of computational theory. He was the first guy to come up with the theory of a computer. Um, he, could, he could be called the inventor of the computer in a certain way. Uh, he, was, he was involved in, in, in building the world's first actual computer. And in, um, in the de definition of a computer versus just a calculator. All right, so if you're interested in this, Alan Turing is a, is a person to look into, and there's the, what they call a Turing machine, which is a computer that can do any program. So, but what we have here is we have a guy typing into a machine, just like in a chat room. And this machine is connected to something in the other room. And this guy has no idea what's in the other room. No idea what's in the other room. And he is being tasked to tell whether he's chatting with a person, with a human being, or a machine. And let's say that completely unknown to him, there's a big computer in this room with flashing lights and, and stuff. Right, so there's a computer in the room, a Cray 9000 supercomputer. I don't know if it's, they have a Cray 9000. I know they have Crays, but I don't know what the numbers are. So it's a Cray, it's, you know, honking great computer. Um, and the, the reason that the, the the way this test came about, this idea came about, is someone was talking to Alan Turing, Turing about computers, and someone said. Um, Dr. Turing, do you think that computers will ever be conscious? And Turing was a very practical man. He was a genius. He was also a very practical man. Uh, he, he paid attention to what he could prove and what he couldn't. And his answer was, I don't know whether computers can be conscious, but I have an idea about how we could tell whether or not a computer is conscious. Now, when they were saying conscious, I think they were not being precise. I think they meant mind. Right? I think they were thinking, Does, can a computer have a mind the way a human has a mind? And so this is supposed to be a test to see if a computer has a mind the way, uh, can have a mind the way a computer, where the particular computer. So his answer was, if a person interacting with a computer through a teletype cannot tell from the quality of the exchange, of the, from the conversation, whether he's talking to a person or a computer, to a human being or a computer, then the computer is conscious. And so that's sort of an external operational, operationalizable definition of a mind. If you can fool human beings into thinking you're a person, you're a person, you're a mind, you have a mind. Now, that's a really cool idea. Uh, there's a couple of problems with it. Um, one is, people have already been fooled by simple machines that are obviously not, um, obviously not people, not, not conscious, don't have minds. There are these things called therapy programs. One of them is called PC Therapist 2. And they're uh, based on a what I think a fairly stupid idea of therapy, that um, it's therapeutic for someone to talk to, to a being that just takes what they say, what they say and asks them um, dumb questions about it, like, how do you feel about this? Why do you hate your mother? Why do you hate me? 
and um, it's this sort of non-directive therapy that I despise. Um, but there's, I mean, one of the reasons that it's, a machine can do it. That, that's a red flag there. A machine can do it. Um, so they have this PC therapist too, and they hooked people up and said, are you talking to a person or a machine? And a number of a human beings said, oh, I'm talking to a person. It's like, no, it's a machine. And we know how this is programmed. We know that PC Therapist 2 does not understand what's going on. It's just an automatic machine right, that can be programmed. And they have more sophisticated ones right now. Um, they, have, they have better chat bots that, that fool more people. Um, so, just fooling people, just getting people to believe they're talking to a, to a, a person, can't be enough. We would have, want to have at least have an expert sitting here, and that might not be enough. Um, in the literature on computer consciousness, they talk about what computers can do better than humans, and what humans can do better than computers. Um, computers can can multiply very large numbers very quickly. So if you say, if you give this computer a random series, sorry, if you give the person you're talking to, if you type in, say, hey, I've got this really long number. Can you tell me if it's a prime? And you type a string of random numbers, 25 digits, right, in there, and send back and say, is that prime? Well, the computer, unless the computer's been programmed to not be able to do it, to, to pretend it can't do stuff, the computer's going to be able to tell you it's prime whether it's prime or not. That's something that's pretty simple for a computer, for, especially for a computer program to do. But if I was programming something to fool people, I'd have it say, no, I can't do that. Right. Right. You can program a machine to hide the computer's light under a bushel. But what you can't program the machine to do, at least not now, is summarize a story. Take a narrative and um, ask, ask him to see the logical implications of it. So you tell it, you know, you, you make up a story or you take a story from the newspaper and stuff and say, hey, can you tell me this in your own back, in your own words? Can you summarize this? A human being can give some kind of summary. It may be a horrible summary. You know, human beings are not necessarily smart. But a human being can summarize a story and can ask questions about a story. The computers we have right now and in the foreseeable future, in the immediate future, are not going to be able to do that. So if you ever try and do a, you know, tell whether you're chatting with a human or a chatbot, that, that would be the thing to ask, to summarize a story, or to trace out logical implications of things. Because there's a, a and to paraphrase stuff. Right, that stuff humans can do that computers can't, at least not yet. But I can think of making paraphrasing engines, computer programs, that would summarize stories without being conscious. Because I think consciousness and having a mind requires a very structured information processing system, a system that's structured the way our brains are structured, or something very much like it. Um, so I think that there's fundamentally there's a defect in the um, Turing test and I would not rely on it or at least not rely just on the Turing test to tell whether or not a machine, a, a machine I was in, interacting with had a mind. Did that make sense? Even a computer does everything, it could still be faking it, it could be programmed to fake it. And we don't want fake, we, we, we want real. So, the Turing test by itself is not adequate to prove that a computer is conscious. Searle argues that computers cannot ever be conscious. There's a, there's a basic, fundamental limitation in computers that says they cannot be conscious. Now, um, 
Oh, I just thought of something. Something else. Um, right. Computers can only do computations, which are manipulations of abstract symbols. Um, right. Uh, I'm going to give you this. Uh, uh, I'll give you the Chinese room, and then we'll um, we'll talk about talk about this other stuff. So the way the Chinese room works is you have a guy who does not speak or read Chinese. And he's in the room with some books that contain symbol translation tables. They don't say what anything means, but they give you rules for converting strings of symbols into other symbols, other strings of symbols. So you think he's got like hundreds and thousands of books there. And he's in a room, and in the wall of the room there's a little slot. And in through this slot from the outside comes slips of paper. Like scrolls or something. And on these scrolls are characters in Chinese. And these scrolls are actually written by someone outside the room who, who actually writes in Chinese. And he's written questions here in Chinese on these scrolls. But this fellow doesn't read, this fellow doesn't read Chinese. But that doesn't matter. Because he's got these books. And he opens the book and he looks up the first symbol. And that first, when he finds that first symbol, it says, go to page 352 in book 12. So he goes to book 12, he opens page 352, he looks at that, and he says, okay, your first symbol is this, what's your second symbol? And he looks around and he finds the second symbol. Or uh, is there a symbol that looks like this involved? Right? It gives you a set of rules, what to do. And so he, and every so often one of the books will say, okay, now, okay, you've got da, 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 da. So what I want you to do now is write these three symbols, then go to page 42 of book 436, or something like that. And so you go there, and, it's like, and eventually it says, okay, write this symbol at the bottom of the scroll you're writing, and you're done. Now, this fellow's got to have a lot of time on his hands. There's got to be a lot of books in there, because doing question and answer in Chinese, it, doing question and answer for anything, being able to answer any question, well, I guess he can't answer all of the questions. There's, some, there's a thing that says, oh, we can't answer this. He doesn't know what they're saying. He doesn't know what question he's been asked. Right. It could be, where is Anne Frank hiding? It was back in the 1940s. And he doesn't know he's being asked about this. And then he writes down the, the information and he passes it out to a group uh, on a new scroll. And this fellow reads it and sends the Nazis to arrest Anne Frank. He, he just does not know what's going on. He is just abstract symbol manipulation. And Searle says, okay, you're in this Chinese room. In the Chinese room. This guy does not understand Chinese. There is no understanding of Chinese going on, but it's answering questions. And it's true, we can make computers that answer questions, right, that look stuff up. Okay? Um, we, can, we can make stuff like that that we know are not conscious. They don't exhibit behavior of characteristic of conscious consciousness and we know how they work and they don't have the complexity or structure that human brains have. So we know they're not conscious and they can do this thing like... And in fact, we have knowledge engines where um, you can put a program in your computer and, uh, and, and give it information and it will ask you questions and you answer the questions and it will, it will build up a knowledge base and then you know more and more complicated questions. What's the capital of Assyria? Nineveh, is it still around? No. And who will bemoan? And Nineveh is gone. Who will bemoan her? 
all that kind of stuff. What's your favorite color? Um, right, so this is the idea. Searle's idea is computers are only like this. And you can create a computer that behaves exactly like a human brain without it actually being a human brain. So, so does this make sense? Any questions? Is this clear? Right there. Okay, I'm going to assume that means I'm beautifully clear. Just, just awesome. When you don't, when you don't ask questions, I just assume I'm an awesome lecturer. So, okay. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Damn. Yes. <laughs> question. Um, so you're saying a computer can have a mind of a human? Right, it's not a human brain, but it has a mind the way a human has a mind. It would be something you could have a conversation with and so be friends is, with. Is it actually real? Do you know if it's really real? You, do you mean would it be real? Yeah, like yeah, it would be real. Cell says it wouldn't. Cell thinks that this proves that I'm wrong about that. Okay. 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 Say it. I said I'm not going to debate this time. Oh, I'm oh, okay. doing the paper on it. Alright, okay, you don't, yeah, you don't have to debate it. It's just any question you, you know. Anyone else got a, got a question? Right. Um, so, this is Searle's, Searle's argument. Now I want to make a couple of, couple of points. Uh, yeah, Garrett. Um, if a guy basically has a Form of translation, can't he technically learn? No. Nope. No. That's a really, really good question. The uh, question is by viewing these symbols, um, and that's actually something that's really brilliant about this way of doing it. By viewing these symbols and going to the translation books and translating them again and again and again and again, which strikes me as just the most, one of the most boring things imaginable. It might be fun the first time. Maybe fun the second time. If you're really obsessive compulsive, it might be fun the third time. But after that, you're just going to want to kill yourself. It, it's just going to be horrendously boring. But the idea is that maybe he could learn it. And my answer is, well, how would he learn it? Think about this following out a set of, set of rules to translate one string of arbitrary sim symbols into another string of arbitrary symbols, of symbols none of which you know, you don't have any traction here to learn how it, to, to learn it. You've got these formal rules in here, but, you know, he's probably never going to figure out that this radical means man, or that this, this one means uh, mountain, or that together they mean wizard, <coughs> or angel in some of the modern Chinese. So, all right, does that look like an angel or a well, wizard? I know that other one is man because if you trample, well, Chinese characters are all about symbols. And You've got words. that yeah, background I, information yeah, that you bring so, to this. I'm yeah. talking about a guy who's never learned anything about Chinese. But I mean, if he keeps Right. He's, 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 he's like a, a you know a super redneck from the deep south <laughs> who, who thinks you know who thinks sukiyaki is Chinese. Food. But as long as he, he doesn't know there's a country called <laughs> 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 right. All right. I as long as he has the ability to learn more, he, can he just? He it's not will see four, things that come. Four, it's not well, be what's four, beautiful four, about this is like that it. it's not a numeric code. I, don't know, right? I, I had a, a, um, a person, gave, uh, one of my friends gave me, right, a person gave me, uh, 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 one of my friends gave me this sort of letter note. It was groups of random letters. Here's a, here's a letter you get. And I looked at it and go, okay, you've got all jumbled up letters. So let's see if this is a simple uh, substitution uh, cipher. And I sat down and I figured out which, I counted all the letters, and 
Um, right? And I took and I figured out, find out which letter was most frequent, and I marked that letter underneath as E every time. And then when it came in groups of three as the last letter in a group of three, I would put T and H under the first two, and then I put those in. And I was able to figure out, just by filling in these kinds of things, going by frequencies and things, in about uh, half an hour, I, I translated the letter and I could, I could read it. But that's a simple su substitution cipher, where letter frequencies can come to the fore. That doesn't apply to Chinese. Chinese is pictures and groups of pictures. It's not, you know, it's not an alphabet. Um, so, you know, and the number of ideograms possible, I mean, a Chinese type, remember those old Chinese typewriters before we had computers that would have all these keys and you wanted to type other things, you had to substitute, it was, it's, it's insane. So, he's not going to be able to, he's not going to have access to that information ever. Yeah. So does he actually have translations, or does he just have books that tell him symbols that go together? He has books that tell him symbols that go together. Right. Okay. That's the thing. There's no translation here. Let's say he's an he's Anglophone. He speaks only English. No English words in there. No pictures. Right. He never learns Chinese, which is my, 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 this must be one of the circles of hell. He never learns Chinese. He never knows what any of this means. Poor soul. Must be a murderer or something. Or, right. So he just does this and he's not going to know it. He's just doing symbol manipulation. And that's supposed to this is supposed to prove that computers can't do minds. Um, so the first thing I want to say about this is um, <coughs> you can't prove that something is impossible by giving a plan that fails, fails to do it. You can't prove that something's impossible by failing to do it. Um, remember that Wright flyer again? Before, they, before the Wright brothers built their airplane, there were numerous other attempts at heavier than air flight. There was a device that had a huge I think, it was, I think it was a steam engine that um, had this rod that up and down in the middle of it and the, the, it made a big wheel and this rod would go up and down, up and down, up and down. And on the top of the rod was this umbrella shaped thing with little slats in it so that when the thing was going up, the slats collapsed and let air go by them. And when it was going down, they opened up and would push air down. And this was supposed to flap the thing into the air. And if you go on YouTube, there's actually film of this thing bouncing up and down as it throws this big heavy rod up and down. And the guy trying to fly is going, ah, it's just a, it's, it's just a disaster. There were numerous attempts at heavier, air, heavier than air flight that didn't work. And numerous plans for heavier than air flight that won't work. If I come up with a plan for heavier than air flight that doesn't work, have I proved that heavier than air flight is impossible? Right. So if Searle proves that the Chinese room cannot understand, has he proved that computers can never understand? Has he come, if he's come up with a way that symbol manipulation will not produce semantics, has he proved that computers can never produce semantics? Now, if you say, and the other thing is, if you say that I can't do something that you do, that you can do, that I could never do something, that something you can do that I could never do, 
and you just say, um, but you don't say how you do it, and you don't say how it's done, then it seems really strange to say that no one else can do it. My idea about the brain is the brain does semantics. If someone's going to tell me that somebody, that a machine can't do semantics, you have to do more than say, well, a machine does this stuff, right? You have to tell me the actual stuff a brain does to make semantics and then give me a reason to think the computers can't do that. Because I know the parts of the brain that make semantics. They're made of neurons. Computers can do neuron stuff. So uh, let's take a break and then I'll talk about why I think the Chinese room fails. Thank you very much. Fifteen minutes.